George Freeman was an interesting, very, very interesting guy. He, um, it was um, after the murder of Colin Winchester um, in Canberra. The federal police weren't getting anywhere with the investigation and I was asked by a very senior officer from there, and I think I was at the National Crime Authority at the time. I'll I just, I just go back a little bit. I arrested Freeman twice for SP bedding. Um, he, he was operating from 2A Manila Place where he lived at Yowie Bay, a huge big mansion of a house. He had, he had rotwheeler dogs and uh, Dobermans in his yard. Um, I got some cops to go to the gate and throw some meat over to feed the dogs and then we bailed over on the other side, went inside and arrested him with his virtually hand in the till. There was bedding material everywhere. Charged him, took him to court, got a conviction. I decided six months later to do it again. So and this time we had to be a bit more sophisticated. So I actually rang him from a telephone box and said, George, if you don't get out to your gate and let the police in, I'm gonna, we're going to shoot your dogs and come in anyway. So when they got in there, he... Um, He'd had disappearing paper. This is how sophisticated they were. So as soon as I'd rung him, they'd thrown all the paper into trays of water and it just disappeared. All the evidence disappeared. And one of the guys I was working with, when they got in, George had missed one sheet and he tried to stuff it into a coffee cup and Bob was able to pull it out and retrieve about two-thirds of it. And based on that, we got a conviction when he went to court. And um, how are you going to use this tape? Because, can I use a bit of language on this? Yeah, that's right. Because when he went to court and we convicted him, he came outside the court and he walked up to you and he said, uh, you're a And I said, oh, thanks, George. I said, coming from you, that's a real compliment. And um, anyway, we, that we parted our ways and uh, it was just before Christmas and we were, I was living at Miranda at the time and the telephone rang and George was on the other end. He said, oh, it's George Freeman, Jeff. And I, I lived near him. I didn't live that far away. Actually, I used to have a little tinny and I used to go around and watch his place from a boat while I was fishing and uh, he said you know he said I, he said, I, um, I used to reckon you're a cunt. he said but actually I admire you he said because he said I know you're straight and he said I know you're a cop that wouldn't walk up to me in the street and put a gun in my pocket but if I had a gun in my pocket you'd arrest me for it and he said no, you know he said I, I, I admire you for that and I didn't know how to take it I just I, I said how'd you get my phone number he said oh, I've got ways and means of getting your phone number Anyway, um, one thing led to another. When Winchester got shot, Peter Lamb, who was the Deputy Commissioner in the Federal Police, rang me up and said, Jeff, we need someone to talk to George. And he said, we don't think you'd talk to a federal cop. He said, and you, he said you know, you're the only person I think he would trust to speak to. And he said, uh, we want you to go and speak to him to see if he can put the feelers out and find out. We, we've, he said, we're getting nowhere with the Winchester investigation. Put the feelers out and see if there's anything there that might help. So I tried to ring George at home and, and there was no answer and then uh, I rang Lenny McPherson and, I, and Len was an uh, informant, a registered informant of mine at the time. I rang him up and, and I said, I need to speak to George and he said, uh, where are you? I said, I'm at home. He said, I'll get him to ring you. Within two minutes the phone rang. That was the, that this is the contact that these people had, you know, that incredible how fast they can get a message through. And George said, uh, oh, I'm down on the stud farm down at Mittagong. And uh, I said, all oh, right. He said, I've had a bit of an operation. I'm just recuperating down here. And I said, I need to speak to you. And he said, uh, well, why don't you come down? And I said, I'll meet you in a coffee shop at Mittagong. He said, no, no. He said, come to the, come to the property. He said, uh, I haven't had it that long. He said, I'll show you over it. So I said to my wife, I'm going down to see George Freeman. She said, well, by yourself. And I said, yeah, I'll go down by myself. I said, like, I, you know, in a funny sort of way, I trusted him, you know. Strange thing to say, but I just, you just get that feeling. So I went down there and he met me on the front for Andrew, he had his pyjamas and dressing gown on and he had uh, either kidney stones or gall stones taken out, he'd been pretty crook. And um, it's like a big kid, you know, he said, oh, he said, you know, come on, I'll show you the property. So he took me over and showed me some stables he had just had built and we're sitting in the lounge room and his wife Georgina, he'd, he'd divorced from his previous wife Marcia and, and uh, he was married to Georgina who was the daughter of a, a Sydney doctor. And had, and had had a you know, good upbringing, good education. And, and it was a classical insight into the criminal sort of um, wife sort of a situation and why they put up with these people. We were sitting in the lounge room and Georgina walked in and she said, Jeff, would you like to stay for tea? And I thought, we said, no, I shouldn't do that. 
and I said, oh, no thanks. I said, no, I won't stay for two. She said, well, look, I've just got some sausages and some green prawns, and I'm going to put them in the barbecue, and I'm going to toss a salad. She said, so you're welcome to stay. And I thought, well, I will stay, because it'll give me a chance just to get to know Freeman a little bit better. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll stay. And she said, George, would you like the barbecue? And he sat there and he said, Georgina, f*** off. He said, can't you see I'm talking f***ing business? Just f*** off. Do it yourself. And she walked out. This is hard to understand for a layman, I guess, but she walked out like a faithful dog. And it just gave me that insight into why these people hook up with people like this who... And George was a violent criminal in his young days. He spent an enormous amount of time in institutions. He had this massive control and respect in relation to organised crime, particularly surrounding uh, gambling and, uh, and betting um, and protection. And, and here he was, that's the way he spoke to her. She didn't take offence in any way whatsoever. She just went out, lit that barbecue, did the cooking, and we went out there later on and had a meal. And then the following Saturday, he was back home in his place at Gaimi Bay. He'd moved from Yowie Bay. And he rang me up at home and he said, I've got something for you. I told him, when I spoke to him in the house about trying to make some inquiries about the Winchester murder, he said, he said, I've, he said look, I've only ever had corrupt dealings with cops all my life. He said, um, he said as far as I'm concerned, he said, you know, coppers, the coppers I've dealt with are just low bastards. And he said, but you need them to do things for you. And he said, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. He said, but look, I can't get involved. He said, otherwise I'll be regarded as a dog amongst, you know, my people. And he said, so you've got to keep me out of it. And I said, okay, no. I said, I'll, I'll give you that guarantee. I said, I'll keep you out of it. So on the Saturday morning, he rang me up and said, I've got something for you. And I said, um, what is it? He said... I'll show you when you get here. I said, did you have to pay for it? And he said, yes. I said, how much did you pay for it? He said, $450. And I rang Peter Lamb and I said, Pete, I'm going down to George's place. He's got something for me. I said, I need to get some money out of the bank. Um, I said, uh, and pay him. And when I went down there, um, I, I gave the 450 bucks to Freeman. He said, I don't want it. I said, no, no. I said, I'm not going to owe you anything. I said, you take it. And... Um, and he started laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you're sitting on it. I got up and underneath the lounge cushion he pulled out a gun with a silencer in it. And he said, I don't know what it's been used in. He said, it's hot. All I know is it's hot. Um, it's been used in a crime recently. If it helps, so be it. He said, but I can't, it can't be traced back to me. So okay. So they actually, I handed the gun over, they tested it and it had been used in a recent murder in Melbourne but it wasn't connected with Winchester. But I, I, I sort of held hopes after that that I'd be able to get closer to Freeman and probably in his, as he got on and, and aged that he might, like I'd, I'd hope for McPherson, actually sit down and start to reveal a lot of the, the, the background and the behind the scenes of sort of organised crime in Sydney. Unfortunately, I never got that opportunity because he died of an asthma attack and his life was cut short.